extensive redevelopment boondoggle, basically, of any American city. They took out whole blocks and blocks and blocks of places. Actually, that's what created the Pratt campus. The Pratt campus used to have buildings on it, but essentially in the 60s, they knocked down scores and scores of usable buildings and made a super block out of it. The Heights, again, wasn't developed until 200 years after New York City proper, because this was just the wilderness. This was all farmland until roughly 1820. The first lots were all for sale in 1819, and they started building buildings after that. At that time, there were only seven houses up here, and the people who owned farmland up here were the people whose names show up in the streets, Pierre Ponce and Livingston. So the Heights history essentially is only about 70 years old. The oldest buildings are, there are some wooden buildings, we'll see further up those stories at this end. Downtown Brooklyn used to be down by the water, largely, because that's where you came from. There was really nothing other than that. And then as the ferry was being constructed, steam power ferries were put in, they connected and Brooklyn began to grow. And then once the railroads were basically put in, they connected with the ferries, and they would basically bring people throughout the city. But this was really the first suburban development. One of the things that happened, though, is that it ended up becoming a relatively wealthy area, a wealthy suburb. A lot of wealthy ship owners, for instance, wanted to be here on the Heights, overlooking their ships unloading the ports on New York side, because that's where the major, the East River was the major shipping area in New York City. There was also shipping, basically warehousing and docks on the Brooklyn side. What happened, though, is that the wealthier the neighborhood, the more desirable the neighborhood, the more change you see. The most stable neighborhoods tend to be the ones that people can't escape from. So we'll see probably next time Park Slope, which was always a middle income, pretty much high middle income, a middle income neighborhood. And as neighborhoods declined and the fortunes changed, everybody more or less stayed the same, stayed in place in Park Slope. Nothing ever developed out of it, whereas here, you began very early to see large-scale development. That big, tall, beige and beige building is the Hotel St. George. Oh, we found one. Okay. Hotel St. George, that was at the time the biggest hotel in Brooklyn. It still is, actually. It essentially was one of the biggest in New York City. It's an entire city block. Art here at the top was an Olympic-sized swimming pool. It's got, they had a, let's see, there's a, at the time was considered the wonder of New York. It has, let's see.
10,000 people at one time. So it was essentially a really big thing, and it was really an anchor for this part of Brooklyn for a very long time. The problem was uh, hotels were not as we consider hotels now. Most of what is now the Upper West Side, if you go up in the, on Broadway up in the <laughs> 70s, uh, were basically residential hotels, and that was very popular. People didn't own houses. They owned hotels because they could live there uh, very nicely, have nice spaces, but also have services. You know, they had group dining rooms and all kinds of services. So they became a, the way to live if you had a lot of money in the city. Uh, what happened was eventually uh, Brooklyn became less fashionable, the people who lived there left, and then the city came along, and any time they found a, a, a vacant kind of space, they used it for a welfare house, where the welfare rolls were. So for a long time, uh, through the late 50s, early 60s, into the 70s, uh, St. George's Welfare Hotel, nobody wanted it. It's now being, piece by piece, it's a whole series of buildings, uh, gradually converted into uh, high-end condos again. Nice. So that's it's coming, it's coming back. Uh, these, uh, all of this here was essentially part of the major clearing that created Kevin Closet Park. Um, again, it took very long time to do that. Some of this land was, was cleared as far back as 1949. Uh, back to the tower, the Kevin Tower is over there, basically. You know, 25 years back. Um, we're not going to pass those. What's interesting about them is that. Although this area looks nice and pleasant now, at the time it was built, which was about 25 years ago, it was still a very dangerous neighborhood. So when you walk around that building, you'll see three men walking around. Uh, they've got outdoor plazas and stuff, but they're all at least a story off the ground. Because in, and the, the building at grade level is basically totally fortified. You can't get near it. You know? So basically, it was considered you know, nice to live there, but you didn't really want to come down to the street because it was still relatively dangerous. Uh, these things were built uh, and are some of the nicest houses used, they called it, the garden space. Uh, again, very simple brick buildings, but because they've, they've essentially articulated so you have depth, there's the boxes that you have to find, uh, and they're also they well. The actual parts of the buildings are the kind of brown windows and the white stucco, uh, so it's not all that fantastic. Um, but overall, the buildings one of the things that we don't get into a lot of architecture is color. And you can create a rather nice building, and if the colors are bad, you basically have problems. These work well. The dark brown brick tends to age really well. Uh, this building is you know, a good example of that example. It's basically concrete because it's full of aged brick, but the results are kind of dull. Uh, I suppose it looks new. Um, this thing over here is an Art Deco building built, oh, when the last additions to the St. George and St. George Tower was being put in. Uh, and it's a really nice example of, of in the Art Deco style, uh, the notion of adding color. It was all done with brick, with polychrome brick, uh, banding and, and colors of the window, the corner windows, and, and some terracotta work. Uh, but they make very handsome buildings, and they also age very well. Again, that building's probably 70 years old. And again, for whatever reason, it looks pretty good. We're going to see a lot of other things that are new or substantially newer and haven't aged anywhere near as well as that building. What was the name of it? Uh, I don't know the name of that. It's, it's on it. Oh, I got it. Welcome to the next 